We Get Outdoors Nation. We're joined today by somebody who does something different to every other guest that I have had on the We Get Outdoors podcast. Some people fall out of things and off things. Some people go up things. Some people go over things. And today's guest has a personal fascination with getting well, I'm going to say dark and deep underneath things. Today we have Derek Bristol, who is um, as close to a professional caver as maybe you could ever get. Uh, Derek, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure, sir. So what what should the world know about Derek Bristol? Uh, Well, again, my, my main hobby is caving and cave exploration. So I live in uh, outside of Denver in, in Colorado in the U.S., uh, and I do quite a bit of caving out here in the western U.S., um, but I've done, a, I've done a bit of caving internationally. And for those that may not be familiar, caving is uh, going underground. Uh, there are a variety of different types of caves. Uh, there's lava tubes. There's glacier caves. Uh, there are uh, what we call tectonic caves. Uh, but most cavers are interested in limestone caves, which are a type of solutional cave. So limestone is a uh, carbonate rock uh, with uh, under natural conditions. You can form caves and caverns. Uh, and my passion is exploring those spaces and and uh, spending time in them. So some of that is recreational uh, and some of it is exploration and mapping. And uh, so I'm fairly active in in uh, in that hobby. Awesome. I, I want to talk to you about expedition or exploration caving in a bit. But I, uh, what I'd like to start with this is, um, in terms of all of the outdoor sports of people I've interviewed, caving probably has one of the smaller communities. Maybe not the smallest, but smaller communities. H- how did you personally get involved or get into caving? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, you're right. It's uh, not very mainstream. Uh, there are no competitive caving events, and uh, it's a pretty poor spectator sport. So, uh, <laughs> so I think for a lot of those reasons, you don't have as many uh, people aware of it, and not, not as many people participate in it. Uh, there's a lot of elements of going into caves that scare people. It's uh, you're in total darkness. Uh, they tend to be wet, muddy environments. Uh, there's a lot of tight spaces. There's a lot of exposure and, and you know, vertical expanses and things like that. So that uh, doesn't attract uh, many people. Um, and I think, again, the lack of uh, there being uh, competitive events uh, sort of means that there aren't as many uh, gear manufacturers. You don't have sponsors. Um, and so it tends to be a smaller sport. Uh, here in the U.S., we have a national organization, the National Speleological Society, and we have about 7,500 members. Um, we've had a bit more than that in the past, uh, it, and the numbers kind of go up and down. Uh, there are probably maybe 10 to 15,000 enthusiasts around the U.S., so there's, uh, you know, not everybody is a member of the national organization. Um, and then, you know, there's probably similar numbers of uh, people in organized uh, caving clubs and things like that in Europe as there are in the U.S. And that gives you some sense. You know, there's several, a few tens of thousands of people that go into caves, either recreationally or for project purposes. Um, but it's not a huge number. Mm. And uh, so you, you don't hear a lot about it about it uh, in the media uh, unless there's something like a rescue or, or something like that, which is maybe more negative attention. Um, but uh People that do it are pretty passionate about it, um, including me. Mm. And uh, so I got started in college. Um, didn't know much about it, as probably most people may not. Um, and I, w- the co- university I went to had uh, an outing program, and they offered caving trips as one of the options. And a friend of mine had gone on one. Uh, this was like a uh, a paid weekend guided trip um, near near where the university I went to was located. So maybe an hour or two drive away from there. And it sounded like an interesting or fascinating, uh, you know, outdoor uh, activity. I'm involved in a lot of other outdoor sports. I do a lot of 
uh, water sports, um, hiking and backpacking, snowboarding and skiing, uh, things like that, as well as rock climbing. And caving seemed like a natural extension to that. So I was really interested in what this friend had done uh, and uh, started uh, taking a few sort of uh, exploratory recreational trips and was really hooked from the beginning. Uh, for me, the climbing and crawling uh, and chimneying and things that you need to do to traverse a cave, it was like a giant playground. Mm -hmm. And I uh, really had a blast doing it. And uh, so that early interest in and the recreational side of caving just grew and grew. Um, and I've gotten more involved in other activities underground. The main thing is, is the exploration side. So a lot of caves are uh, still being explored. And it's one of the sort of the last frontiers uh, on earth, one of the last sort of uh, unknown or, um, you know, uh, places that uh, are st still being uh uh, discovered every mm. year we find miles and miles of new cave passage uh and the best way to explore caves is by going in them and and mapping and so it's a little different than some of the other sort of traditional what most people think of as exploratory activities uh, we have satellites that sort of cover the earth now and uh so there aren't many places on the surface of the earth that uh don't escape um you know, the attention of cameras. And uh, there's not much mystery left in in terms of things like the highest peaks on on the earth and things like that. But the longest caves and the deepest caves are still sort of unknowns. And there's, there's still things that we're uh, discovering and exploring. Uh, one of the sort of starkest examples of that is that the, as recently as 2017, there's been a change in the deepest cave in the world. Um, the deepest cave now is uh, uh, very of Kina, uh, probably mispronouncing that, but it's a deep cave in, uh, in the country of Georgia, Eastern Europe. And uh, it was pushed to the deepest point just as recent as 2017. So there's been a change in that. And there's likely to be more changes in that, the ranking of deep caves going forward. So. We don't know for sure what the deepest cave in the world is. Um, likewise, we don't know what the longest cave in the world is. So right now, the longest cave is Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, mm. uh, a little over 400 miles of surveyed length. And uh, there are several other caves that are 100 to 200 miles in length. Uh, Mammoth Cave is pretty far out in front, um, but there's some very long underwater caves in in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico that are uh, close to being connected that may, those caves may become the longest with uh, continued exploration. So it's sort of a fascinating, if you're interested in exploration and discovery, it's, uh, you know, you can pick up a guidebook and go someplace that you haven't been before, but there aren't many places you can go that, that nobody has been before. The caves are one of those last frontiers. It's an opportunity to sort of make a mark and, and discover something for yourself. So that's one of the big draws or fascinations. And you mentioned Georgia just then. It would strike me that there's a huge amount of the Eastern world, including Eastern Europe into Russia, China, Japan, the sort of uh, uh, Asia, that, that part of the world, where a lot of that has barely been trodden on by mankind in in real terms um and i know that you can make a lot of judgments around the geology of rocks and and rock types to know like stack the deck in your cards and sorry stack the deck in your favor to go somewhere but i would guess that when you start getting to some of those places you're into a just a big unknown. You could go and spend three weeks there and never never spend more than 20 minutes underground or spend three weeks exploring the next largest cave system. Yeah, definitely true. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a reasonable amount of information about uh, the geology of different areas. And so you can look at the uh, limestone and the, and the sort of conditions in different parts and sort of make a guess that there's likely to be uh, you know, deep caves or long caves in a particular region. Um, but you're right, there's still areas of the world that are hard to reach and that um, uh, relatively undeveloped 
uh, maybe lack uh, good road access to certain areas and things like that that make cave exploration easier. And caving, cave exploration is definitely a sort of uh, leisure time activity. So uh, in places of the world where the economics maybe aren't as favorable as they are in the, in, in uh, Europe or, or North America, uh, maybe the, the people that live in those regions don't have the time, energy, or, um, uh, you know, to, to do cave exploration. So, mm. um, there's, uh, uh, places like China that have very extensive karst, which is the, the type of topography that forms caves, uh, uh, typically characterized by a lot of limestone and sinkholes and things like that. Um, there are vast areas of China. Uh, vast areas of Eastern Europe that uh, have seen very little exploration activity. So yeah, there's there's a lot of potential out there. Um, I'm leaving in a couple of weeks to go on expedition in Mexico and uh, the central mountains of, of southern Me Mexico uh, on uh, to a cave system called Cheve. Uh, Cheve is the second deepest cave in the Western Hemisphere uh, currently, and again, is still being explored. And it has the potential to be the deepest cave in the world. It has uh, hydrologic activity. So there's uh, underground streams and stuff that have been dye traced. Um, and it has a depth potential of over 2,600 meters. Um, the deepest cave in the world, Barry of Kina, that I mentioned, is a little over 2,200 meters in depth. So uh, the Cheve system has the potential to, to be deeper than that. But there are uh, different segments of that cave system it's it's all connected by water water flow um but it hasn't been fully explored and so uh, we don't consider a cave system sort of connected until a person has traversed it all so hmm. uh, there's uh the bottom areas of the cheve system you run into a relatively horizontal passage that's filled with water uh what we call sumps Yep, and those are uh, some of that has to be explored by cave diving, which is log logistically very complicated. Um, and so there's uh, there's still uh, an effort and push to try to connect some of the other upper reaches of the Cheve system to the resurgence where the water exits. Um, and I don't know the exact numbers, but I think the upper entrances are close to three thousand meters, and the resurgence caves are down around. Uh, a 400 meters elevation. So, um, so there's still, uh, again, there's uh, still a lot of unknowns and a lot of exploration going on and, uh, and potential to find longer and deeper caves. And, and I guess there's a huge time cost involved because you, you've, you've got to get into the system, get all your gear and everything you need for however long you intend on being there to a certain point. I suppose the, the, the last explored line in the sand as it were um and and then i mean how how much real exploration can you actually do in a few weeks by the time you've got everything in there and got everything back out again yeah it depends a lot on the cave and the cave mm -hmm. system uh, so the cheve system that i mentioned is very deep uh and it um it's not the most remote cave passage by distance but uh, in terms of travel time and logistics, it, it's probably one of the more complicated, you know, the frontiers of that cave to push, push those frontiers and do additional exploration. You're right. It takes a lot of time, a lot of uh, people power, a lot of equipment. Um, and uh, it's a very vertical cave, so it requires a lot of rigging and, and things like that. So uh, it takes a lot of time to set all that up. So the expedition that's going on started uh just a couple of weeks ago and will be underway and through the end of april so it's uh something like 14 week long expedition wow um, and so that's the kind of scale uh required to do all the setting things up getting camps established um and it's sort of been um sort of one of the associations so that people can get some a better understanding of how it's done is is it's a little like mountain, uh, high elevation mountaineering in reverse. Um, <laughs> you know, if you go to uh, high, you know, eight thousand meter peaks in the Himalaya or whatever, they they do a series of camps and they have uh, uh, Sherpas that uh, carry equipment or sort of rig the, uh, um, you know, the route to get from one camp to the next mm. and then bring supplies. 
And we do the same sort of thing in these uh, large uh, uh, deep cave expeditions. Uh, there's a series of camps. There's uh, Sherpa trips that happen to um, bring gear and food and, and supplies uh, into those camps. And then you have push teams um, at the deepest camps that are doing the exploration and mapping. Wow. And forgive my ignorance, but I can just imagine myself running out of AA batteries. Um, <laughs> and if, if you're underneath the ground for that many weeks, I mean, that's a, 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 it's a vast quantity of food, water, toilet paper, so on, and uh, sleeping bags, clothing, so on and so forth. Um, because you can't stay wet and cold 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Otherwise, you'll get quite uh, poorly quite quickly. Um, but the, it just sounds like the logistics to get electricity down there to go and ensure that your lights are charged enough. I mean, talk me through that. How do you pull off something like that? Yeah, so for the, the main uh, use for electricity underground would be for lighting. Uh, we use uh, headlamps and uh, he you know helmet mounted uh, lights and you know the uh, there's been advances in technology so nowadays you have uh, very high efficiency very bright LED emitters and then the other sort of big benefit of, in recent years has been the, the advancements in lithium ion batteries so you have very high charge density uh batteries that are rechargeable and um you know very efficient leds and uh, um uh, so a fairly small battery pack can power light for up to a week uh of wow. active caving so they're they're pretty amazing um so typically uh it's it's fairly uncommon for cavers even on these uh multi-month expeditions to go underground and stay underground for that entire time. I think um, typical camps would be a week to two weeks. Uh, people will go underground either as part of uh, an exploration team or maybe a supply team, uh, and then they'll come out, uh, come back to the surface, recharge batteries, uh, uh, recharge their souls, I guess. It takes a little bit out of you to spend so much time in the dark underground. Mm. Um, so. Uh, Anyway, yeah, LED batteries, uh, sorry, LED emitters and and uh, lithium batteries have kind of revolutionized cave exploration. Uh, back in the old days, uh, it was more common to use calcium carbide, what, what are called carbide lamps. Uh, and so a lot of cavers use those. And you could carry uh, enough calcium carbide with you to, you know, uh, spend weeks underground. Um, but it's uh, it's heavier and it has uh, waste byproduct you have to deal with and that sort of thing. When you're dealing with calcium carbide, so that's it's all but uh, been eliminated now. Uh, mm. Most everybody's using lithium-ion batteries. And, and how's that readjustment after a week or a week plus underneath the ground uh, in the dark, and then you suddenly come back up to the bright sunshine and the heat and the noises and everything else? How's how's that feel? Yeah, it's a good question. A lot of people ha are curious about that. Um, uh, the longest I personally spend underground is 11 days. Uh, I've done a number of eight day uh, periods underground. Um, it's, uh, you don't lose the pigment in your skin. You might get a little paler, um, but you, uh, you also don't lose your vision and your eyes don't, uh, skin doesn't grow over your eyes. So, um, I don't notice much difference. Uh, some of your senses uh, do seem to be a little more sensitive when you come out from underground. Um, there are sounds. You are using artificial lights when you're underground. So um, when you come back to the surface, sometimes the sun seems a little brighter. Uh, definitely the sounds of nature are a little more, uh, you know, unfamiliar, I guess. And uh, for a lot of people, the thing that strikes them is the smells and stuff that you have on the surface, just the smells of nature, which uh, uh, you don't have as much of when you're underground. So um, those things become a little bit more, you're a little more sensitized, I guess, to those things after spending yeah. a while. And so then the other, the other thing that strikes me is um, you, you're effectively going backpacking in, in a caving system in, in many respects. Um, 
How do you pull off that underground camping? I mean, there's there's a huge amount of moving parts to get there. Obviously, there's the Sherpas. But uh, what's what's that experience like, you know, turning the light off and it's genuinely echoey and dark and maybe a bit damp? And then that that's how you, I don't know, what, what's it like? Yeah, it is, it is a lot like backpacking. So we try to carry uh, lightweight gear that, like you would on a long distance backpack mm. uh, to only carry what you need. Um, it's definitely, if you, if you're spending, uh, multiple days underground in a cave that has a lot of crawling and things like that, then the large pack is a, a serious liability. Uh, so we try to, um, travel as light as possible. Um, the other thing that people are curious about when you're underground, there's, there's no natural light sources at all. You provide your own light. And so there's no sunrise and no sunset, um, no night or day. And you can kind of set whatever schedule you want. Um, uh, so you can be on whatever shift you want to be on. My preference and what I think most people prefer to do is to try to stay on a 24 hour cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, and so use alarm, you know, alarms on our watches and things to make sure we wake up on time. And, uh, it takes a couple hours in the morning to sort of have breakfast and get things sorted and ready for a day of cave exploration, but we have a stat we'll typically use established camps, um, as opposed to, you know, doing, uh, occasionally exploration is done so-called Alpine style where you sort of going fast and light and find a campsite along the way. But in most cases we're using, it's more expedition style where we have established camps. So any impacts can be, um, uh, sort of isolated to that camp. Um, one of the key things that's required to have a camp is a water source. We don't, we typically don't carry all the water we need for an expert, you know, for a week underground. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to establish camps near a water source. And in a cave, like we were describing in, in Mexico, uh, these are river caves. So there's water is quite abundant, but there are other cave systems, um, especially here in the Western U S um, I do a lot of cave camping in uh, jewel cave in South Dakota which is a very dry cave. So there's very few water sources, no, no pools, no running water. I should say very few pools. And there are very occasional water drips that come in in places. And uh, we uh, will set up water collectors in those areas uh, and use that for, for drinking water. But mm. yeah, you need a water source and able to, to establish uh, a camp. But um Anyway, we'll, I typically try to stay on a 24 hour cycle. Most of the cavers I know do the same. Uh, there are people that will extend their day, quote unquote day to 30 hours or 36 hours. Um, and so they may sleep for 12 hours at a time and then be out, out of camp for 12 or 16 hours at a time. Um, and they find that to be more efficient. Uh, but you end up off cycle, you know, you, you end up waking up and going to bed at sort of odd hours. Um, but there's, uh, you know, fewer rules, there's fewer reasons to sort of stick to a 24 hour schedule. But the, one of the main reasons is if you have cavers coming in and out, uh, you know, bringing in supplies and trade off and personnel and things like that, it makes it easier to sort of know what schedule people are going to be on so that you don't walk into camp and people are asleep or walk into camp and everybody's out exploring. Yep. Um, that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a little easier if everybody stays on the same schedule. Yeah, it's true. I've done a lot of work guiding both in the summer and in the winter up in the Arctic Circle, where, you know, middle of end of June in the Arctic Circle, it's 24 hour daylight. And, you know, end of December, it's 24 hour day darkness. And uh, unless you're very conscious of your watch and what time it actually is, it's it's very easy to keep going till 11 o'clock at night in the middle of summer because it's still feels like lunchtime in terms of the, the weather. Um, but equally, you can cause danger for yourself because your body's not really used to doing, to have it, your body's not used to a 36 hour day. It's not what it's been programmed to do over however many years. And I think it's a funny, funny trade-off uh, in terms of safety. Hmm. Tell me about safety. Yeah, I think people that go to that, I think people that go to that type of schedule, uh, they'll gradually move towards it. So if you're going to be underground for two weeks or something like that, yeah, you wouldn't, um, maybe the first day you wouldn't, 
uh, go that far off schedule. Mm. Uh, there are occasions, I, I mentioned Jewel Cave in South Dakota, which is the third longest cave in the world and has some of the most remote passages in the world. So it takes uh, 12 hours or more travel time to get to some of the, the, you know, the boundary of the cave where it's being explored. And because of the logistics there, and because it's such a dry cave and, the, and there are very few places to set up water collectors, uh, we uh, typically have very long travel times, even though we use underground camps, uh, they're in very specific places. Uh, and we, um, we end up with uh, sometimes five, six hours of travel from a camp just to get to where you're starting to explore and map. And uh, so for, for those reasons, a lot of times we do uh, leave and go out of camp and we may be gone for 18 hours or more. And mm -hmm. then because you have such a long time away from camp, uh, you're pretty exhausted. And then we'll end up, we may come back to camp and sleep for 12 hours. So uh, we do get off schedule there, but that's more out of necessity. Um, when you're in caves where the exploration objectives are within an hour or two of camp, you can kind of set your schedule. You have a bit more flexibility, but um, sometimes the logistics don't allow that. And you were asking about gear and stuff. Well, typically for cave camps, it's a lot like backpacking. We carry a sleeping pad. Um, typically synthetic bags are used because of the moisture mm. and high humidity in the cave. Um, sleeping bags, uh, canister stoves uh, for cooking and things like that. Um, not much that you wouldn't see on a, a long distance backpacking trip. Uh, we typically do not need tents um, because you've got a roof overhead. <laughs> it doesn't rain. Um, some people will carry, it depends on where you're camped, but uh, sometimes poly tarps are used to block wind or block if there's a, if it's near a water source and there's a mist or something like that in order to keep the camping area dry. Sometimes poly tarps will be hung, but, uh, and usually a ground tarp to sleep on. Mm. Um, but other than a water source, you also need a flat spot. Um, it is possible to set up hammocks and some people have established camps by you know, sticking a bolt in the wall and, and hanging a hammock and sleeping in that. But uh, that's less common. It's it's more often the case you try to find a flat area. And what are you wearing? Um, sorry, this is it's a whole new world that I'm stepping into here. So, um, and, and I guess you're going to say it depends on the cave system. Um, but uh, <laughs> I... I my I've only been caving I don't know 20 or 30 times so I don't have any great experience of it um I but I do remember coming out of spending a day in a cave system and um consistently I always feel uh quite cold when I get to the end I feel often wet and often muddy um and I'm just imagining day in day out do you have like a a wet set of clothes that's for exploring and a dry set for the camp or how, how do you manage that? Yeah, definitely uh, for expedition uh, style caving where you're sleeping underground, you would have a set of dry camp clothes, as you, as you say, and, and a set of dirty cave clothes, usually just one set of each. Mm. Um, uh, you get pretty dirty caving, so you're not too concerned about hygiene. We'll, we'll use uh wet wipes or something like that to try to keep face and hands clean. But, um, but you just kind of, uh, get comfortable with being a, a bit dirty for a while. Uh, I think anybody that's done much outdoor activity is kind of, can kind of understand. Um, yeah. there are caves that are particularly muddy and wet. Um, but yeah, the, the clothes we wear, the, the equipment we use is very dependent on the cave. Um, I think you're probably aware most caves are, constant conditions. So not only are they dark all the time, but most of them are a fairly constant temperature. Uh, you don't have weather systems, so you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, whether it's going to rain or snow, but, um, it's, uh, if you looked at the weather forecast in a cave, it's the exact same every day. So you can, you can at least plan for that. Um, and so for a lot of caves, uh, cave suits are a common thing. Most are like one piece coveralls. And uh, uh, if you've been caving twenty or thirty times, that's pretty good. That's more than the vast majority of people. Was that was that mostly in the UK? Yeah, uh, mostly in Wales in the UK. Um, uh, there's uh, when I was at high school and and primary school, we uh, every year we got to go away for a week to an adventure sports centre, and um, or some years we did two weeks. 
And um, so I, I did did quite a bit through. Normally there was a caving day in each week. And then the the club where I learned to kayak when I was a kid did some caving as well. So I got to go and hang out with those guys and go and see what they did. Um, so I wouldn't like to pretend to be any good at anything. I just, just I've been underground and squeezed myself through bizarre places and contorted my body into ways I never believed it would be bent to, to go and uh, get to different, through different systems. Um, yeah. Yeah. I went to, uh, I visited South Wales in 2019, did some caving there. That's some very long caves. Uh, some, of, um, of course the longest in the UK, mm. um, yeah, great, really great, uh, caving area, but yeah, it is a little wet and muddy and cold. Um, uh, in that part of the world. Um, but, uh, I've, I've found, I think I saw recently a survey that suggested that there's greater awareness about caves and caving in the UK than maybe any other country. And, uh, I think it's, uh, a lot of what you described that there's a lot of, um, people that grow up there that are exposed to, uh, you have like scouting and rangers and mm -hmm. a bunch of outdoor programs for youth and they're exposed to water sports and climbing and and caving as part of that. And uh, I think there's a, a very high percentage of the public in the UK that has an understanding of what caving is and what why caves are important in the environment, mm. um, that sort of thing. Much greater awareness than what we have in the US. I was, I was just going to ask about the uh, the environmental side of it because, you know, a, when you're exploring, you're treading in places or crawling in places where well, obviously nobody else has ever been or highly unlikely they've ever been to. Um, but you're also going into places where you really don't have that much idea about what actually is down there or moving around or is there anything living or nothing living? How do you end up uh, protecting the environment and doing exploring without damaging at the same time? Yeah, I would say it's uh, one of, if not the primary consideration for cave explorers, experienced cave explorers, is trying to um, visit caves uh, while trying to protect it. And uh, so we we try to educate new uh, people that are interested in caving, as well as the general public, on the importance of conservation and leave no trace. And it's a uh, it's especially challenging with caves. It's more challenging than in other parts of the environment um, because caves aren't exposed to the elements uh, like they are on the surface. Uh, if you if you camp in a um, pristine meadow or something like that, um, or you discard something in a river, uh, those are you know those are behaviors to be avoided, of course. But the impacts of that in time can be. Um, you know, the environment has a way of sort of healing itself. Um, it's a much slower process underground in caves. So um, when you go into an area that hasn't been explored before and you lay down footprints, which is almost impossible to not do. So even the most conscientious cavers uh, leave some mark of their passing. And those footprints may be there hundreds or thousands of years later. So um, there's... Uh, if you're in caves that flood frequently, there's there's maybe some issue, there's some mitigation there, but a lot of caves uh, we have what are called paleo passages. They're not actively active uh, actively forming cave passages anymore, but uh, still places that we explore and, and visit. Uh, it's really important to uh, uh, try to minimize any impact. So for those reasons uh it's we we really want to encourage anybody that wants to that's interested in caving and is and wants to uh, uh um, see what caving is about to get a hold of local clubs or national organizations and get connected with uh experienced cavers that can take them uh both for safety reasons and for conservation reasons sort of educate them on how to travel through caves safely, what equipment, what clothing to bring and wear, and uh, how to avoid impacts to the cave. Uh, a lot of the impacts, I think, are out of um, just a lack of knowledge. Mm. And so um, it's it's uh, difficult to find good resources on the internet. Uh, there aren't very, very many books that are published on, on the sport of caving. And so the best way to learn these things is uh, through connection with um, the organized caving community 
So in the US, we have a national organization, the National Speleological Society. In the UK, you've got the British Caving Association. Um, and then the, the NSS has uh, um, about 100 um, regional clubs that we call grottos. And they typically meet on a monthly basis and they regularly run beginner trips um, to help people get involved in the sport. And we sort of encourage people to go that route. So if they want to, if they're interested in the sport and want to get involved, um, get, in, get in touch with their local grotto. And there's usually friendly people that will take them uh, on, a, on a cave trip. Mm. Uh, there are clubs, university clubs, um, a lot of scouting groups and things like that do occasionally uh, do caving trips. Um, but they're usually uh, sort of plugged into local grottos, uh, caving clubs uh, mm. to help with, with that. But um, yeah, so we, th so the best way I think to protect caves is to get involved in uh, local organizations um, and go about it that way. Um, but I think it's important to try to educate even the non-caving public about the importance of caves. Um, there, there is a lot of sensitive life. There are many endangered and threatened species that use caves, um, either for things like hibernation in the case of bats, or they may live their entire life cycle in caves. And because caves are uh, relative, relatively rare, um, a lot of the life um, a lot of the life forms that use caves are uh, can be rare as well and have special adaptations. And so um, it's important not to disturb them during certain life cycle events. And again, uh, it's important to get involved with the local caving community to help educate people about uh, which caves have sensitive resources like that. Caves are also really important um, in uh, as a uh, recharge areas for aquifers so for water quality in areas that have karst again this is uh, where you have solutional rocks um rain falls uh, and then it doesn't necessarily flow across the surface into lakes or reservoirs um, in many cases it flows underground and into aquifers and then people pump groundwater or pump uh, drinking water and stuff from those aquifers and so um, it's important to understand that, again, for the general public so that you can avoid uh, pollution or contamination of aquifers and help to protect them. Um, so a lot of development um, and a lot of activities, that industrial activities, commercial activities that happen on the surface can negatively affect uh, groundwater quality. And a lot of it is, again, just a lack of education and understanding. Um, so it's, I think hmm. it's important even for non-cavers to to have some appreciation for it. It strikes me with caving that there is a hell of a lot that you can choose to learn because you've got massive elements of what of what the rock climbing community would recognize um, with all the you know rope access work and all that side of things. And then I guess you've already mentioned cave camping is quite similar to backpacking. So there's all that. And then there's all of the hydro hydrology and geology behind it as well. Um, I mean, it's, it's a lifetime's pursuit to go and learn enough, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, if all you were interested in was the recreational side, uh, there are horizontal caves where you have, uh, you know, lights and knee pads and, and coveralls and you just, walk around in a cave and explore mm. uh there's a little more advanced uh requirements in what we call vertical caves where you have uh, vertical pitches pits or domes to uh, rappel down or climb up uh, and that requires um, additional gear and training to do that uh, you have uh we mentioned earlier sumps or underwater cave passage uh, that requires uh, cave diving equipment and skills and that's a very specialized very complicated uh, uh, area of caving. I just cave say, that's, that, that sends shivers down my spine, by the way, scuba diving in a cave. It just, that sends chills down my yeah. spine. Yeah. So it has a reputation for being one of the most hazardous activities you can engage in. I think it's gotten a lot safer over the, the last several years. The equipment and training have gotten a lot better and the techniques have gotten a lot better, uh, but it is still significantly more dangerous than, than so-called dry caving. Um, but then you, you know, so beyond recreational caving, there's, uh, there's a vast number of, uh, things you can do underground that are 
what we call project caving. And there's a lot of science that goes on. Um, there's uh, hydrology work that goes on that may, you know, the focus may be on um, getting a better, better understanding of uh, uh, water, how water drains in an area and how it affects aquifers. Um, there's uh, a lot of science that goes on around cave life um, and microbiology. Uh, there's uh, uh, there are people that are very uh, committed to things like photography, underground photography. So um, cave photography is kind of a specialized area. A lot of people spend time doing that. Um, and there's um, for caves that are on public land, uh, there's a lot of management activities that go on trying to um, monitor impacts and things like that. Uh, so that the caves are managed appropriately. And then um, there's a huge area in the exploration and mapping side of things. So um, we, uh, which is what I spend a lot of time doing is uh, going underground to um, survey and explore. Uh, some of that is uh, surveying passages that have sort of been previously explored. Sometimes the old data or notes may be not up to modern standards. And so we, we may be uh, trying to improve the quality of the data and quality of maps. And some of it is new exploration. And uh, so there's a lot of people that do that. And again, if you're going underground for a quote unquote work purpose, not necessarily paid for it, but if you're if you're there for science or exploration or or something like that, we kind of put that in a category we call project caving. Mm. And it's inevitable, I think, that people that uh, get involved in caving for a recreational interest um, over time, they uh, very often uh, start picking up different project interests and start doing more and more trips for that purpose. So. Um, please forgive my ignorance, but uh, I, I've done a fair bit of mapping above ground, um, you know, and, and a, a compass and a GPS works really nicely. Um, I have no idea. I'm assuming that a compass and a GPS does not work the same way underground. Uh, so compasses do, fortunately. Okay. I was gonna say, uh, so, okay, that's good. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the rock doesn't block the Earth's magnetic field, so compasses work just fine. Hmm. But GPS is radio based and it doesn't uh, does not penetrate through rocks. So um, GPS is useless underground, uh, but compasses work fine in most places. There are uh, instances where there's uh, high iron content or things like that where it might throw off a compass reading. But that's uh, uh, magnetic compasses are the are one of the tools that's used to survey caves. Um, and there's a. Uh, there's a lot of different techniques now, and there's there's some new techniques that are sort of increasingly being used, things like LIDAR for doing um, three-dimensional mapping. Mm. Um, but uh, the traditional way of, of uh, mapping a cave is you um, survey similar to what you would do in places on the surface where you have a sort of a known starting point. Usually that's the entrance of the cave, and you establish a what we call a survey station, and then you... Uh, set up a neck, the next station has to be line of sight from the previous station. And you measure, you take three values. You take the distance between them. You measure the azimuth. That's the magnetic angle from your compass. And you measure the vertical angle, what we call the inclination. And from those three measurements, you can, uh, starting at a known location like the entrance, which maybe you can get a GPS coordinate, an accurate uh, coordinate for that starting point. And if you know the XYZ, you know, longitude, latitude, elevation, let's say, mm. for that entrance station, uh, you can uh, compile the survey data and get an XYZ, an accurate XYZ reading for the next station. And you do that progressively. You go from station to station to station. And uh, we have enough precision and accuracy in the equipment we use that you you generally within, you know, very, you have pretty high tolerance at, um, you, know, you get pretty accurate data, mm. um, almost to the point where uh, there have been commercial caves that are developed where they use this type of survey data uh, if they want to establish an elevator shaft and drill down and hit the cave passage. Oh, wow. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, a couple miles away, you'll be within 10 or 20 feet uh, accuracy on a cave survey. So, um, usually, what's done before you spend the money to drill a shaft would be to 
do what's called a radio location. So there are specialized radio transceivers and, and um, transmitters and receivers that can be used on the surface and underground to more accurately locate um, where somebody is, you know, directly below the surface. Um, but those types of radio location efforts with good quality, modern uh, survey techniques, they usually come out pretty close. Like I say, you can be a couple miles under a couple miles away from an entrance and just be 10 or 20 feet off in terms of uh, that's, uh, survey accuracy. So it's pretty good. That's very close. I mean, a few miles on a mountain and to be 10 or 20 feet off would be, um, you'd, you'd have, have a big smile on your face. That would be pretty accurate without a GPS. So when right. you, we, we've spoken about uh, quite a lot about um, uh, cave exploration and caves that are known. I suppose one of the things that I'm curious about in most outdoor sports is where's the next frontier? Um, where's the, if you were a betting man and you would say this country, I don't know, Siberia, that's where there's going to be something incredible. When, but we haven't got there yet. Where, where do you think that may well be? Uh, great question. I don't have tremendous insight into where the next, uh, uh, major caving area will be. I think, uh, there's a lot left to be done in, uh, places like China. Um, I was supposed to be on expedition in China in April and May of 2020, but as you can guess, that plan didn't come together. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're, we're looking at trying to reschedule that, but, um, um, yeah, there's a tremendous amount of karst in, um, in China that's not yet explored. Um, so that, but that's, most cavers are already sort of aware of that. Um, uh, they're there's been some expeditions in places like Iran and Turkey. Um, and, uh, uh, there's some, uh, very deep cave systems being explored there. Um, so most of the frontier though, would be in places that, uh, uh, don't have a lot of population. Um, you know, and, and so there haven't been a lot of people on the ground sort of looking. And one of the unique things you, if if you didn't know, you might expect that um, satellite imagery or LIDAR techniques or things like that could identify cave entrances quite easily, but it's not the case. So there are a lot of places of the world, um, equatorial regions that are covered in jungle. Um, there are uh, uh, lots of mountainous regions where, you know, cave entrances can be in cliff faces where satellites can't see them. Mm. And so... Um, uh, discovering new cave entrances and new caves, a lot of times takes just legwork. You have to walk a region and a lot of times try to, you know, go to uh, great, great lengths to reach otherwise inaccessible areas. Um, and so there, we have this sort of in the U S the term is ridge walking. I'm not sure what they, how they describe it in other parts of the world, but, uh, um, in parts of the U S we're still finding new caves even though there's a lot of cavers, relatively speaking, and and uh, a lot of population in many areas, um, new caves are being discovered every year. Some of those are significant, uh, turn out to be significant, mm. and uh, so so. Uh, uh, anyway, the sort of old-fashioned walk around, uh, we call it ridge walking, because I think in lots of parts of the eastern U.S. Uh, limestone areas have these ridges and. Uh, they're covered in cave entrances, and so walking around looking for looking at holes in the ground, and a lot of times it's a small sinkhole that's uh, choked with logs and loose rock and things like that. You move a th you move a few things around, and you find a cave. So um, things that you wouldn't necessarily see in a satellite image. Uh, it just takes uh, hard work and exploring on the surface. Mm. So there are there are definitely a lot of cavers who um, that's their passion is finding is looking for the next mammoth cave, you know, the next big, uh, long cave discovery, um, through looking for looking at new entrances. Uh, my, I spend more time exploring known caves and looking for new extensions in those caves. So for looking for new passages in caves where we already know there's a cave there and I have pretty good luck, uh, finding, uh, uh you know, extensions to known caves. How do you find that extension? Are you just looking for a 
tiny hole that disappears off to the left-hand side in a passage, for instance, and seeing if you can excavate some of it out, or how does that work? Yeah, there's uh, yeah. So a lot of it is looking for obscure things. Uh, uh, if it's uh, a known cave, generally we're going off of uh, cave survey notes is, is the most efficient way. So whenever a cave passage is surveyed, originally. Uh, you'll reach forks or junctions in the cave passage. You'll you'll see sort of potential what we call leads um, going passage, uh, and you choose which direction to go. And then the other the other side you didn't go down is left as a lead for later. And so the survey notes can be a good clue and where to go to f- to find additional passage. Um, but uh, there's other things that cavers use uh, caves. Um, oftentimes breathe. So uh, air flows in and out of caves or through caves by different means. And so um, paying attention to airflow is a good way to find um, undiscovered cave passage. Uh, the other thing that's uh, that I'm involved in is um, climbing. So I do a lot of uh, climbing up into alcoves or climbing up domes to look for passage at the tops of places that are hard to reach and have had a fair amount of success doing that. Mm. But if a cave passage was horizontal and it was easy to walk into, usually those have been explored long ago. So um, the easy leads are are few and far between. Yes. Yeah, it sounds like if you want to go and find the next frontier, there's a, a money and time thing that comes into how much time can you afford to wander around a limestone region to go and hopefully find a cave entrance? You know, that could be, I was interviewing a mountaineer the other week who spoke of a six week trip in Pakistan where he didn't climb once. Um, And so I guess you could end up in that sort of place, couldn't you? Um, So the, the next thing on my list is, for me personally, uh, and I've been involved in the outdoors my entire life, and there's not a lot in the outdoors I haven't done. Caving always feels like the least safe thing that I've done in the outdoors. And I can't work out whether that's emotional because of darkness or whether it's 100% bound in, like it really is flipping dangerous. Um, I, I can't balance it in my head. And I wonder what your perspective was on that. Yeah, I think it's uh, probably more of an emotional response. Uh, It's uh, a little bit of, uh, for a lot of people, I think there's a fear of the unknown, right? And things that you aren't uh, comfortable with, that you haven't experiences that you haven't had before. And so caves being in total darkness, um, oftentimes very confined spaces. Uh, So there's, very often crawling involved and fitting through tight squeezes, which is a, an extremely unfamiliar thing mm-hmm. to do for a lot of people. So those things uh, sort of trigger people's fears. Um, statistically, though, I think it's one of the safest, as safe as many other of the safest outdoor activities. So I think statistically, there uh, you're probably as safe as if you were backpacking. Mm. Um, and it depends a little bit on what type of caving you're doing and where you're doing it. So there are some very deep vertical caves. The more you're on rope, probably the more risks and the more exposure you have. Um, and uh, I guess the other thing that uh, is a fear for a lot of people is, is the fear of getting lost. So there are caves that are fairly mazy and uh, complicated. Um, and we have, uh, again, if you go with experienced cavers, uh, it's pretty rare that it, an experienced caver will get lost or disoriented. It, it does happen occasionally, but uh, and usually we can fix those problems before our friends find out that we made that mistake. But um, <laughs> it's, it's usually uh, temp- temporary. We didn't. We're not, we don't get lost. We get temporarily disoriented. But um, but anyway, it's. Uh, I think yeah. Some of the for some people the the darkness the wet and muddy environment, the tight squeezes uh, are the fears. And there are some uh, relatively high profile rescues uh, that have happened uh, that sort of reinforce that fear with some people. So occasionally uh, someone gets stuck and uh, uh, that that's a big fear trigger for a lot of people. 
and uh, occasionally people get lost and have to be rescued. And again, that maybe sort of reinforces the the thought in some people's minds that it's a dangerous activity. Um, but you know, like rock climbing, uh, if you have one incident out of a million occurrences and that gets on the news, uh, might for some people give them the impression that rock climbing is unsafe. Um, but I think caving is uh, at least as safe as rock climbing, maybe more so, uh, probably much safer than uh, high elevation mountaineering. Mm. Um, and so it's it's among the safer outdoor sports if done correctly. So again, I'll, I'll reinforce that it's important that people are interested in it, uh, contact their local caving community and have somebody experience, show them um, what equipment to bring and how to do it safely and and with low impact. Yeah, and I think as with as with anything, uh, take it steady. Go like go don't don't go and decide that you're going to do something really hectic for your first time. Just something sh- short and enjoyable that will put a smile on your face. Um, right. It's, it's it's interesting. We spoke before we went on air. My my a lot of my background has been in whitewater kayaking or well, all sorts of kayaking, but a lot of whitewater kayaking. And um, I I became very well aware that if I could do shorter classes for people and ensure they have a huge smile on their face the entire time that they keep coming back and they keep that they then end up saying they love the sport and uh i think for anybody that's the environment you want to learn something new in is small steps big smiles and somebody who can stop you making a fool of yourself or or putting yourself in danger at the same time it's pretty simple absolutely you, there's there's definitely caves and cave trips that are quite miserable, <laughs> and there are uh, a, a minority, a small handful of cavers that are attracted to that. And um, I'm probably in that category. Uh, but yeah, if you want to attract new people to the sport and keep them engaged and keep them coming back, uh, probably best to avoid certain caves and certain trips at least early on uh, and, until they. Uh, until they start to become annoying, and then you can take them on one of these trips. That's the career-ending trip. <laughs> I've, I've got to ask, what, what is it about miserable caving that makes you keep going back? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, it's. I mean, uh, have you done much mountaineering? Uh, yeah, fair, fair it, bit. It, yeah. Yeah. So the joyful parts of that can be few and far between, right? It's a. Uh, in some cases, it's about how much suffering you can endure, and uh, I don't think caving is any different. So if you look at um, People that do, uh, you know, distance running or things like that. A lot of it is about challenging yourself and doing something that's not easy to do under difficult circumstances and overcoming that. And there's a certain reward that comes with that. And uh, if you're doing it with other people, as you know, caving is a uh, team activity. Um, it sort of bonds you to each other. So it's hard to. It's a great feeling when you go through something difficult and do it with other people that are suffering as much as you are and you come through it and achieve, you know, whatever goal it is you're trying to achieve. But uh, there are definitely caves and cave trips that um, are guaranteed misery. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) sometimes we do it because it's because it's miserable. I did I did a 130 mile um canoe race uh about 10 years ago with a very good friend of mine maybe 12 years ago and um you you portage uh, get out and run your kayak for I don't know anywhere up to half a mile on occasions uh, and then you get back in and carry on going and there's there's no stages you just you, you get on at the start and you finish it's the first person to the end that you know 130 odd miles later that uh that it stops and i can honestly say that the only reason for for doing the race is the bacon sandwich and the cup of tea at the end um that's like because <laughs> the the bit in the middle is is just suffer that's all it is just suffer <laughs> yeah <laughs> wow so um so if people want to get involved, they need to go find their local club um, and take it easy and go and find their version of caving that puts a smile on their face. What what do you think that the, the progression of caving is going to be? I mean, how deep, how remote, how far? 
what, what would you be guessing towards? Uh, it's a great question. Like, what are the limits? Um, I don't think we've found them yet. Uh, every time we get to some place that's um, extremely remote, very difficult to get to, the logistics are kind of unfathomably difficult, and the passage passages keep going on. You kind of think, boy, you know, eventually we're going to reach the limits of exploration. There's going to be a going cave passage, and we're going to we're just going to have to turn around because we don't have enough water, enough food, enough endurance, whatever it might be. And um, every time we reach uh, a place like that, we figure out some way to get past it. So I haven't, I have yet to, uh, and I've been involved in some of the most remote places underground. Um, I can mention a few, uh, I've mentioned uh, System Achebe already, which is is, uh, really remote and deep cave. Um, I've been involved in a cave in New Mexico, Fort Stanton Cave. Uh, you may not have heard of, but it's uh, it's growing. I think it's uh, getting close to 70 kilometers in surveyed length now and uh, has the most remote areas of, of any cave in the world. Um, so from it has a single entrance, and there are uh, cave passages uh, that are open going passages that are 20 kilometers distance from the surface. And in caving terms, that's a tremendous distance. So to travel that underground with, you know, crawling and climbing and all the other things that are required of traversing underground, uh, that's extremely remote. Mm. And uh, we're, we're still able to get out to those areas and push the boundaries and come back with survey data. And the, every time we do that, the extent of the cave is a little bit further and a little bit further. Um, so we keep finding ways to overcome these difficulties, and uh, I think we'll continue to do that. Um, there's there's uh, certainly some boundaries and barriers when it comes to um, cave diving and, and some of the underground uh, underwater passages that are being explored. But again, the technology continues to advance, and um, I think we'll see, you know, I think uh, it's just like if you look back 50 or 100 years on um, uh, you know, people calling certain peaks unclimbable and things like that. Those, those barriers, those, um, if you, if you make a prophecy like that, it's sure to be, um, broken at some point. So I think okay. the same, same applies to caving, whether it's, uh, new techniques or, uh, new equipment and technologies that will help, um, you know, push the boundaries a little further. Um, I, I've learned not to question the uh, determination and willpower and stuff of the previous generation of cavers. It's always sort of amazed me what they were able to do with the equipment stuff that they had. Mm. Um, and uh, hopefully, I hope um, current generation can uh, impress the next generation. Likewise, you know, with grit and determination, what, what we're able to accomplish with the tools we have. I guess it just becomes a um, just one big logistics game at the end of the day. Um, if if you're 20 kilometers down a jeep as uh, down a tunnel or a, whatever you call it, sorry, I lost the word, but uh, um, that's a that's a ginormous logistics game to get enough food and everything else down to the end of the tunnel to where you can start exploring. That's a that's a mammoth human task all on its own. Yeah, it is for sure. Um, yeah, and it, when uh, like in that in that cave, that's uh, again Fort Stanton Cave in New Mexico. Uh, it's a very linear cave system, so uh, you have to travel vast distances uh, to get to the end of the explore passage. But uh, there's been uh, some discussion about uh, the possibility of maybe drilling another entrance or th- something like that to facilitate exploration. But we just haven't reached the limit yet to where that something like that would be necessary. And the cost and logistics of doing uh, something like that would be um, would be difficult to overcome. But uh, um, yeah, for those of us that are involved in those exploration trips, there's a little bit of, um, yeah, this is getting really difficult. It'd be nice to find a different, an easier way to do it. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, like I said, some uh, to some degree, you kind of embrace 
you really enjoy the fact that there's something that's that challenging, that difficult to accomplish. And then once you just sort of push back, push past um, perceived barriers, um, huge sense of uh, pride in being able to do that. So, so what's your personal goal or goals within caving uh, for the, the rest of your days? Do you have some things that you'd like to achieve that you haven't yet done? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I don't have many days left, of course. <laughs> I'm getting up in years. <laughs> I don't know, Maybe three, two or three. Three hundred sixty-five times forty or something. I reckon you're in for. You'll be all right. Yeah, I don't know. I, I got two or three good years left. Maybe. Um, so I, uh, I'm pretty happy. I've been doing a lot of exploration in the national parks in the U.S. So I, I'm involved in survey and exploration in Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, which is the longest cave in the world. Uh, the the Black Hills of South Dakota have two really significant caves, Jewel Cave and Wind Cave, which are the third and seventh longest caves in the world. And I'm pretty heavily involved in those. Uh, I do a fair amount of work in Carlsbad Cavern and Lechuguilla Caves, which are in New Mexico. Lechuguilla Cave is the eighth longest cave in the world uh, and, and one of the most beautiful. Uh, and I do regular expeditions in both of those caves. And so I, I plan to continue doing that. Um, I've been on uh, four long expeditions in Mexico and hope to spend more time doing that in the future. I think those caves are, are spectacular. Um, and so hope to continue uh, uh, working on those. Uh, last year, well, now two years ago, 2019, I did an expedition with a British group um, to the caves of Mulu, which is in, in Malaysia on the island of Borneo. Mm. and. Uh, the big cave there, the long cave, is called Clearwater Cave, uh, which is um, what I think it's a hundred and uh, get my metric English mixed up. It's something like one hundred and uh, thirty-five, hundred and forty miles. So whatever yep. that is, two hundred fifty yep. kilometers, roughly. Yep. In survey at length, and uh, so there's enormous caves in uh, this Mulu region. In, on the north and the Sarawak area of uh, of the island of Borneo, and uh, so the Mulu Caves Project, which is a British-led project, and they work in cooperation with um, Malaysian cavers and Malaysian government. Uh, they they're doing regular expeditions there, and again, I got invited in 2019, and I'm hoping to go back again. Uh, there's plans to possibly do another expedition in late 2021. Um, I think the pandemic is. Uh, throwing a wrench into a lot of people's outdoor plans, uh, cavers are no exception. Um, so uh, things are getting moved and rescheduled, but hopefully uh, that'll get back on track soon. Um, wow. Yeah, so those are some of the things. And I mentioned that I was supposed to be in China in, in 2020, and I hope to get back there. I have not been before, so this would be my first time to um, expedition in China. It'd be eye-opening. Eye we looked at uh, doing a whitewater kayaking expedition to Vietnam um, quite a few years ago now. And uh, <laughs> the, the whitewater kayaking, the first descents you could go and do was just out of this world. But there was um, there's still a vast quantity of ordnance from the Vietnam War still floating around in some of those regions. And uh, it, it turned out that the uh, getting to the rivers and getting back and maybe portaging round rapids was probably going to be more dangerous in terms of losing a leg or, or losing your life than actually kayaking the white water. So we decided to we decided to ditch it because I, I I don't mind the risk of risks involved with outdoor sports, but the idea of being blown up didn't seem particularly appealing to me. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think so. <laughs> So um, last, before we, before we move on uh, and, and, and bring this to an end, if, if you had a, um, a message for the caving community out there, um, what, what would it be? Well, first and foremost, and I've said it maybe twice already, well, but I'll say it a third time, is if you're interested in getting involved, I personally would encourage anybody that uh, has an interest to uh, to try and get involved and see what it's like. Uh, for some people, it's become uh, a passion uh, for for me and many of my friends. Uh, uh, it is a lot of what we uh, think about outside of family and work. Um, and again, I would encourage you to get involved in local clubs in your local caving community to to get started. 
Um, I have a YouTube channel, which you may have seen. Um, mm. It's just under my name, Derek Bristol. And I have, uh, I've made over the past uh, almost four years now, I've made about 170 videos. And uh, most of those are oriented towards people who are already cavers. So I have a lot of tutorials and gear reviews that are mostly just of interest to other cavers. And so they, some of them go way into the weeds on details on uh, techniques and things like that for, for caving. But I have quite a few videos that document cave trips uh, and expeditions. So if you're interested in what a uh, cave trip is like and or what expedition caving might be like, which would be more advanced uh, set of skills. But um, I have a whole series of videos on on uh, that cover those topics. Uh, we um, the caving community, especially in the U.S., is very secretive about caves. Uh, there's you won't find guidebooks with cave locations. Uh, you don't find very many uh, manuals on caving technique, uh, other than through uh, sources like the National Speleological Society. Um, so if you go to your local bookstore, you're unlikely to find much there. Um, and a lot of it is uh, that secrecy is one of the tools that's used in the U.S. to to protect caves and protect people from caves, to protect people from getting injured. But it's a bit of a double-edged sword. It's uh, something that um, it ha it can be effective, um, but it also has the negative of maybe turning people off to caving and cavers because they seem sort of standoffish and they seem unwelcoming at times because of that uh, secrecy approach. Um, but if you sort of unfortunately, I think the reality is if you had a guidebook with cave locations in it or magazines with cave locations published, um, they would inevitably get vandalized and you would inevitably end up with um, uh, an increase in cave rescues and things like that. People thinking it it's okay to just pick up uh, their cell phone flashlight and uh, go exploring. And uh, this already happens to some extent. And uh, so the secrecy thing is a, is a strategy that's used to try to help minimize that. Um, but again, it does have the negative of, of making the caving community seem kind of standoffish and unwelcoming. Um, so I'd like, I guess I'd like people that aren't, haven't been initiated and maybe interested, I would encourage them to reach out to their uh, local grottos, like local caving clubs and get involved that way. Um, and again, the, the videos are a way to kind of maybe look and see what a caving trip might be like. Um, a lot of my trips are survey trips. So that's, uh, again, maybe a little bit more specialized. Mm. Um, niche within the the world of caving but um but you can take a look at that if you want and then i have a website also uh, derekbristol.com and i have um a page on there on uh how to get started caving and i uh produced in cooperation with the national speleological society produced a series of four videos on an introduction to caving about a year ago and that's a good place for people that are interested in learning more about what it's what it's about and kind of seeing um, what cave trips are like. Uh, they can go watch those videos and the website's a good place to find that information. Yeah, it's a super cool website. And we'll put all of the links for the website, the, the YouTube channel and everything in the description for this episode for anybody who wants to go and, um, well, either learn from Derek or just stalk him um, and find out what he's doing at the moment, one or the other. Uh, Derek, I want to I want to thank you for taking something that I was unsure about where this conversation was going to go to, and just sharing a your passion, but the amount of breadth and depth that there is to caving. The amount of it, it's not just about being wet and dark. It's actually there's so much more to it that you can, if you like the rope side of things. There's that side of caving. If you like exploration and mapping there's that side i just think um there's probably far more in caving than people ever realize and i'd encourage everybody to go and follow derek and i don't know take a, a leaf out of his book and go and, and get involved and go and see if it's if it's a no if it's an if it's a scratch they want to itch because uh certainly personally speaking um 
I want to go back and relive some of those childhood experiences or teenage experiences that I haven't had for quite a few years now. So Derek, thank you so much for everything you do to bring caving to the world. Um, I'd like to encourage more cavers to do the same. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate your interest and uh, thank you for your time.